frankly, if not for AUB, I would be a member of a long lineage of craftsmen, woodworks or carpentry or something like that. The year is 1856. Reverend Daniel Bliss and his wife Abby finally sail into Beirut Harbor after a long and arduous trip begun in America. Driven by faith, Bliss is ready to embrace his new life in the service of the Protestant mission, spreading the word of Christ in the region. 19th century Lebanon, with a shoreline framing East Mediterranean waters, is still part of greater Syria and a major element of the sprawling Ottoman Empire. The Bliss couple joins Americans seeking to preach the Protestant gospel to Christians, Jews, Muslims, and Druze. European languages and translations of classical works are gaining currency in Beirut, opening new avenues of discovery. Curiosity about Western thought is on the rise, and intellectuals begin seeking ways to adapt these ideas to an Arab context while asserting the need for an independent identity. As the 19th century progresses, the missionaries' goals gradually shift. They realize that religious conversion starts with education. Bliss settles in Su'il Gharb in the region of Alay. The boarding school he runs is such a success that W.M. Thompson, head of the American mission in the Middle East, calls for founding a college for higher learning and medical training in Beirut. Bliss accepts the challenge. He sets his mind to raise the funds needed and sails to America to launch a campaign to collect $100,000 in the midst of the American Civil War. Bliss meets William E. Dodge, known as one of the merchant princes of Wall Street. Dodge is so impressed by Bliss's character and determination, he helps Bliss to raise the funds he needs from Protestant communities in America and in England. In 1864, the state of New York officially charters the Syrian Protestant College, SPC. In December 1866, the Syrian Protestant College opens its doors in a residential area of Za'a el Blat to the first generation of 16 students. The first professors, all missionaries, perfect the Arabic language to spread the word of God. They teach all subjects in Arabic. A fundamental part of the colleges established in 1867, the medical school. Dr. Cornelius Van Dyke is one of the first medical professors, along with Dr. George Post, the first to sedate a human patient in Lebanon, and Dr. John Wardabet, professor of anatomy and physiology. The first class graduates in 1870. Soon enough, the need to expand beyond the small rented space becomes pressing, Bliss and David Stewart Dodge, son of William, discover the ideal location. The plot is near the tip of Ras Beirut, a rocky headland pushing out to the Mediterranean Sea, only accessible by cactus lanes and stony donkey paths. The founders buy the desolate patch of land for $8,000. In 1871, William E. Dodge, now the treasurer of SPC's Board of Trustees, lays the cornerstone for College Hall. At the inauguration of College Hall, President Bliss proclaims the institution's principles and high ideals, defining its ethos for generations to come. This college is for all conditions and classes of men, without regard to color, nationality, race, or religion. But it will be impossible for anyone to continue with us long, without knowing what we believe to be the truth and our reasons for that belief. The SPC is founded to offer young men access to modern, Western-style higher education, along with a devotion to Christian ideals. Dr. Cornelius Van Dyke, SPC's professor of internal medicine and astronomy, initiates the building of an observatory. Van Dyke is assisted by Faris Nimr. They keep meticulous records of meteorological data 
and telegraphed daily reports to imperial observatories in Constantinople and Vienna. The work of the missionaries laid a foundation for the scientific discoveries in the region. In 1882, the college faces its first existential crisis, one that sets in motion a 50-year struggle over the evangelical purpose of the education at SPC. In his commencement address, Professor Edwin Lewis, a chemist, argues that Charles Darwin's theories of evolution are based on sound science and praises him as one of the greatest scientists of his time. The speech flies in the face of established religious doctrine and what college authorities consider as unquestionable orthodoxy. Lewis is forced to resign six months into the affair. The thing is that this just the mention of, the, of Darwin was considered at that time, as many things are, uh, a great scandal and, 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 and something unacceptable to the, uh, uh, to the faith, etc., etc. Pillars of the Protestant community see Darwin's theory of evolution as opposing the beliefs on which the SPC was founded. After the departure of Lewis, professors sharing his convictions walk out in a dramatic show of solidarity. Among them are Dr. Cornelius Van Dyck and his son William, who had shared Darwin's teachings in their SPC classes. The principle that uh, a professor should not be allowed to expose a, an existing theory and talk about it at the university uh, was anathema to the spirit of the university. Uh, and that's what the university does. Uh, he felt that, that he could not continue to work in a place like that. A clash of ideologies shocks the faculty and student body, leaving its mark on the college. Many send in angry petitions in solidarity with Lewis. The students rebel. Thirteen are expelled. This was the beginning of the stirrings, really, of the, of the student movement that eventually took on many shapes over this, the century that followed. And the, the authority of the university was questioned. The dramatic walkout by some of the founding professors at the medical school strips the college of most of its lecturers who can teach in Arabic a turning point for the SPC. The disaster diminishes the importance of Arabic as the principal language of instruction and the role of local lecturers. English, already used in literature classes, starts to become the main language for teaching. The Board of Trustees imposes a declaration of principles requiring new professors to affirm their adherence to the faith. In 1902, after 36 years as president, Bliss retires and is succeeded by his son Howard, who ushers in a fresh perspective committed to securing a more modern approach. By then, student enrollment is over 600 and the college campus boasts a dozen stately buildings. The faculty has expanded to 40 and that same year, the college buys a property across the street from campus to establish a 200-bed hospital. Howard Bliss abolishes the Declaration of Principles, and at the outset of World War I, religious study becomes optional, shifting the college further away from its evangelical Protestant roots towards a secular institution of higher education. What is the relationship of God and man? It's an exploration, really, of our common humanity. And that's what's the focus of a true liberal arts um, curriculum. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapses. France takes over Greater Syria as a mandate power and divides it. Modern-day Lebanon is carved out by joining Beirut province and Mount Lebanon to surrounding regions. The British draw Iraq's borders, pledge to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine, and split up their mandate there, creating Jordan. In 1920, the college formally changes its name to the American University of Beirut and abandons once and for all its founder's missionary goal. Regardless of national origin, faculty members are given equal institutional rights as their American counterparts. Enrollment swells to unprecedented levels, as a small step taken 15 years earlier is about to blossom into a historical milestone in the world of higher education.
The first group of women joins AUB in 1905 in the School of Nursing, the first in the region. By the 1920s, women are admitted to other fields of study. Sarah Levy becomes the first female graduate of AUB with a degree in pharmacy. Ihsan Shakir from Egypt is the first Muslim woman to graduate from AUB. By 1947, AUB has 800 women in its student body. Their contributions alter forever how society perceives women and how they view themselves. At that time, the fashion was that we would wear tight skirts and also that we would wear some heels and the heels were thin. It was uh, astonishing for me, at least as a young man, to see co-eds on campus. Not only that, uh, women teachers, oh my goodness, a woman is now bossing us, so to speak. Yeah, that was uh, a bit uh, strange to us. Definitely the idea of co-educational uh, was for us very interesting because we, had, we were in a girls' school, as you know, and to be in the same classroom with boys and to uh, be able to have friendships and talk and uh, was really, really very nice and uh, appealing to all of us. The region is changing at an accelerating pace. At AUB, Western intellectual thought adapts to Arab ideologies and creates a generation of Arab intellectual prophets. Well, my father uh, it is, uh, was born a Syrian and from Damascus. Of course, Palestine was a big part of his life uh, also because um, um, he was uh, also at the young age when the Nakba happened. And he wrote Man and Nakba, the meaning of the disaster. And he, he coined that term. And Palestine stayed with him all, all his life. And uh, people think he's Palestinian. <laughs> mm. Mm. I mean, Professor Zray was the real mentor for thousands. This is because he's uh, so, so open-minded uh, professor that lived the, he lived the history of the region and understood exactly how the history of this region is complementary, complementary with all its components. And this opens the mind. In June 1945, following the end of World War II, Delegates from 50 nations meet in San Francisco to sign the charter that would establish the United Nations. 19 of these delegates are alumni of AUB, more than any other single institution in the world. Charles Malik, an AUB and Harvard graduate, represents Lebanon at the San Francisco conference. Angela Zuldak Khouri, an early female graduate from AUB, is secretary general to the Lebanese delegation. Charles Malik plays a critical role in drafting the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, along with American First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. He later succeeds Roosevelt as chairman of the commission and also serves as president of the UN General Assembly. The post-World War II era is a difficult phase in Arab history. Zionists occupied large parts of Palestine following the end of British rule. This was the a critical period politically in the region because of the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. So my whole political identity was formed at AUB. It was very, very interesting and very, for us, uh, transformative because it's our first experience into debating uh, freely without fear I think the most important impact on me as a student was the liberal education that you get in class and outside the class. That you can think, that you can argue, that you can debate, that you can be skeptic, that you can be, uh, that you should probe and that you're encouraged to probe, is, that's what university life is all about. So anybody who knew AUB then or later to think that AUB is an extension of American foreign policy will be a fool. It was the cradle 
of national awareness, if you want. A wave of young and spirited AUB alumni begin taking the reins of power in the region, altering the political and business landscapes of the Arab world. Alumni of AUB helped form newly independent nations from the Middle East to North Africa and as far as the Republic of Maldives. The fleet of well-trained graduates design and build oil pipeline networks in the desert and start companies that form the bedrock of regional economies. Scholars and historians leave their mark on academia, in Arabic language and literature, and economics. Chemist Kostas Isidorides and Mahlouf Haddadin invent the Beirut reaction, a chemical reaction that lays the foundation for cancer treatments. Selwa Nassar becomes the first nuclear physicist in Lebanon. AUB doctors continue the long tradition of bringing state-of-the-art medicine to Lebanon. Ibrahim Dagher performs the first open-heart surgery in the Middle East in 1958. Medical graduates establish hospitals in Saudi Arabia and Iran and lead public health efforts in communist China. A period of extraordinary growth for medicine at AUB culminates in 1970 with the opening of a new 420-bed teaching hospital, now the American University of Beirut Medical Center. Lebanon and Beirut rise to the forefront of progress in a golden age of economic prosperity, modernity, and a cosmopolitan lifestyle in the region. 60 countries, every religious faith and sect you could think of, honestly. Uh, people from Africa, West and East, from Afghanistan, Iran, India, Pakistan, Philippines, some of them of Lebanese heritage who were coming home. It was electric. last long. We were in the red, in badly in the red. President Kirkwood said, you know, we are in financial difficulty and might not be able to pay salaries. It's very simple. The AUB decided to uh, enact an increase of 10% on the tuition fees, saying that the AUB is running a deficit in a sense. This was not to our liking. The student revolution was part of the political evolution in the region uh, because the student council was mostly Palestinian. 10% this is against the poor, against the Palestinians. Palestinians trying to have a presence and poor Lebanon is the only place they can. AUB is the only place they can express themselves and visibility because it's American and their kids. We started escalating things, you know. We started by demonstrations, then started taking one building after another, and then we occupied all of AUB. We surrounded Marquin House. We were inside again, Elisa Alem, Dean Rosen, um, Charles Malik. Charles Malik slept under the piano, and he wanted the plaque saying, Charles Malik slept here <laughs> for three or four days. I was jailed for 19 days. I was the last one to be released. My father was very harsh. He was the state prosecutor then. His office was on the fifth floor. I was in the dungeon down in the basement. And he didn't release me. I was the last one. I stayed for five days alone. And all the issues in micro that we were tackling were the macro issues that, that ultimately led to the civil war, or call it what you may, of 75, uh, 75 yes. Kirkwood had the nasty habit of bringing our weekends for the slightest problem. He would call us, come down. But when he... Uh, called on April 13th, 75, for us to come down. We were fed up because we didn't know what happened. 
and from then onwards, things turned very badly. Ter terribly bad. The first year, in the 75, was a very bad year in the war. The 75, uh, 76, the first two years, there was a lot of violence in Beirut. There were, there were many killings, there were shelling. There was shelling across the city. Uh, there were wars over the hotels. And there, were, or there were many, uh, and we were right in the middle of it here, of course. I remember a lady, American lady, before they were evacuated, coming to my office and said, Dr. Tavi, what, what am I going to do? A student came to my office and said, uh, uh, look, I didn't do too well, but you've got to promote me. And as he, as he said, that he opened the briefcase and there was a gun there. She was terrorized. The war uh, had a devastating effect on the AUB, on the academic level, on the attendance in classes, on students coming from distances, being arrested on the road, some killed, some kidnapped, uh, faculty members being kidnapped, and so on. As the war progressed, AUB suffered more because people were leaving. But everybody who stayed on campus sort of uh, mobilized themselves, particularly the students, they would go and get, somehow get sandwiches and serve everybody. And so it was a, a good feeling of solidarity that we all had when we were in situations like this. There were clubs, but the clubs were moving more and more towards being representative of a party than actually carrying on activities. So I think a bunch of us who actually were interested in being uh, in activities for activities sake, uh, we're getting more and more alienated. So uh, they decided that uh, we should do an, um, an art for art's sake activity. So it was called Indoors. It consisted of closing down the West Hall and allowing all the existing clubs and a couple of new ones to use different spaces of West Hall to display what the clubs are about. So considering that Indoors was a success, we decided to hold a sequel. And after a very quick calculation, we realized we're not gonna fit inside the West Hall. So, Outdoors was born. All the students from AUB were gathering around uh, the Green Oval, um, and they were watching this fashion show, and I was fascinated. Like, oh my God, all these people are looking at the wardrobe that I wear every day to college or I go to parties to. And um, I remember the moment, the exact moment, when I went on stage, I had a microphone uh, on with me, and I had said thank you to everybody, and that was the moment when I decided that my career was going to be what it is today. I had dreamt it in one split second and I went for it. I think this is the legacy of outdoors that nobody seems to associate. That the fact that you want to express yourself through art doesn't mean that your self-expression um, is worthless, actually. You have a valid opinion as much as the highbrow intellectual opinion. You just express it differently. And then the war in earnest. The Israelis surrounded Beirut a week from now. And the siege of Beirut started, which was, yeah, no, a very sad. So uh, a week from outdoors, the same uh, dancers and, um, and uh, fashion models and, you know, uh, actors and musicians showed up. But this time we organized uh, the AUB Relief Committee because uh, Beirut at the time had like, um, about two, three hundred thousand refugees converging on schools and makeshift houses. Unsettling years follow the Israeli invasion. In 1983, a suicide bomber rams an explosive-laden truck into the American embassy compound a few hundred meters from the AUB campus. Similar suicide attacks devastate U.S. Marine barracks south of Beirut and other positions of a multinational force called in to keep the peace. By the mid-80s, Americans and Westerners become prized targets in the midst of Lebanon's chaos. 
armed opportunists trade kidnap victims for money from the highest bidders. Nejem Nejem, a Palestinian-Jordanian student under psychological stress, assassinates Raymond Russon, Dean of Engineering, and Robert Njemi, Dean of Student Affairs, in broad daylight. The AUB community is devastated. The war is now inside the campus. In 1982, AUB's acting president, David Dodge, disappears from campus. He is held as a hostage for one year. So when Malcolm was uh, elected, uh, we did not encourage him to come, but he was insisted on coming. The political factions were unbelievable in those days. Um, and there were times when he perhaps thought that he should come home and worried about his family, but um, you, don't, you don't quit, you know, you just don't quit. You know, uh, he was a scholar. Uh, he didn't, uh, how, he wasn't a, a public relation man, you see, a scholar. He's brilliant, but this had nothing to do with running a university then, you see. I, I had just finished teaching my class uh, in Fisk Hall, I think, or, yeah. and then was going out to meet a friend in front of the campus, so I went out to wait for her in the rain in the, at the main gate, and uh, then they called me into the office, the security office, and uh, I knew then something had happened, so... Tuck, tuck. Uh, just, I thought it was a saucer, a plate that fell, until Maggie came to my office and said, Dr. David, Dr. David, President Kerr has been killed. God, I opened the door and there he was, blood all over the place. Oh, awful sight, awful sight, awful sight. An awful period, nightmarish period after that, nightmarish. But I went to the hospital and um, uh, there, I don't, you know, it was raining and it was chewing on my, on my umbrella or something. That's all I remember. And Raja Khoury was there, <laughs> Fadlo's father, and he's, he was the one who, who told me, pronounced Malcolm dead. And he had been shot probably, um, probably never knew what happened to him. So we always held on to that. Uh, you know, it, hopefully he never knew what hit him. <laughs> And that's always been a consolation. Um, yeah. His his murder was terrible. It was condolences, uh, funerals, uh, very sad, very moving. People liked him because they knew he was a scholar in Arabic matters. Uh, I had the misfortune, the unfortunate job of meeting the press and uh, telling them what had happened, what we hope would happen. Of course, the question was, is the university going to close? I mean, I, I, my first thought was that definitely the university got to close. But we kept on, we kept on. So we were very active in fundraising to keep the, the university open. The, the alumni of AUB, you know, this is the AUB community, the alumni. They were very caring and uh, and they all came out and, and helped. The AUB hospital administration and staff worked day and night to keep the hospital operational in the midst of the chaos. Dean Samuel Asper and Raja Khouri do everything in their power to safeguard the AB community and the people of Ras Beirut. The hospital had to function, and of course you face all the problems of the war where you have uh, no electricity, which we face right now, uh, no um, water. Uh, we had to use the sterile, uh, sterile water of the dialysis unit to bathe the babies, uh, because you know the babies you, you need to take care of them. And so this time y y during the crisis, it just got worse and worse, and more and more people left. There was a bombing downtown one day, and the hospital received approximately 57 casualties in 60 minutes. Uh, 
and uh, you could see the faculty move into a uh, wartime status and quickly evaluate patients as they arrived and there were really three outcomes for uh, patients as they were brought in and they were triaged to either be sent to the operating room, sent home with minor injuries, or sent to the morgue. Uh, and that's the way the uh, faculty responded. Did it, uh, I wouldn't say heroically, although it was heroic, they did it as a matter of routine, difficult business. No matter how hostile some of the parties were, uh, the fact that they would get the best medical care in the area made them somehow protect the UB. In a period of time when there was segregation of much of the country along religious or sectarian lines, the fact that Ross Beirut remained diverse, open, with a faculty that had people from every religion, every sect, every background, every political affiliation speaks really to AUB's preeminence in this area and its lasting impact on people. AUB gave me, gave us, all the students then, a real sense, not only of normality, but also really of transformation. It's Particularly if you compare it, the outside to the inside. What was on the outside was war, was death, was destruction. And you enter the walls and you were in a, in a, in a very different space. In a space that was, uh, not only gave you an education in the classrooms here in Nicely Hall, uh, but also um, it gave you a sense of what life could be. And the fact that that was able to transmit hope over 15 and a half years when the war in Lebanon was catastrophic. More than 5% of the population died. A good 20% were wounded or injured. Many were displaced and many immigrated. It tells you specifically when this part of the country remained a beacon for tolerance and hope and, and enlightenment and innovation, that's the impact of AUB. The Lebanese Civil War officially ends in 1990, but on November 8, 1991, a powerful car bomb destroys College Hall, as well as parts of Jaffet Library and Assembly Hall. The laying of a new cornerstone in 1992 launches the reconstruction of College Hall. On August 7, 1997, the bell, undamaged by the explosion, rings out for the first time in six years. There was this feeling that because of the Civil War, AUB had kind of drifted out of mainstream academia, had lost its visibility. It was kind of chaos. All for the best of intentions and very understandable because you, you just didn't know what was going to happen from week to week. So people made up things. And so I had a priority to try to get a certain uniformity in, in how we dealt with everything from personnel to budgets to promotions. Accreditation. I lived this process, which I think was the best thing that happened to AUV, because it helped us focus. This was pre-internet times and, and, uh, and pre, you know, the, the, 
airport and, and the whole postal system, the whole shipping system did not work at that time. That process was not easy for everybody. I, I had a, an older woman come to me after some ceremony in my first year. Uh, she worked, I think she worked in the hospital. And she, long reception line, and she comes up and shakes my hand. She said, President Waterbury, don't do any damage to this place. We, it's all, it's all our family. And then I learned that her father, her grandfather, her mother, I mean, you know, the family had worked for AUB for generations, not in high positions, middle range positions. And she was telling me, don't screw this up. <laughs> wow, okay. <laughs> John uh, set a machine, uh, you know, uh, in, in place in order to bring AUB, I believe, to where it is right now. After the end of the Civil War, uh, a lot of people met for the first time in AUB. Lebanon had this air of hope you know, 93, 94, 95. You had people coming from the Gulf and from England and from the United States. And we found each other here. It was a freshman class of everyone being here for the first time. It was just the most amazing experience. So we were walking down Hamra Street and I saw a poster on the wall that had uh, outdoors, it had an elephant on it. And it said, outdoors 95. So it's like, I stopped, it was faded. My God, I almost like cheered. <laughs> Wow, there is outdoors. It continues. So this whole idea survived. AUB offers a unique world to, to, to which each and every one of us responds differently to recreate his own world. It's just not about that one chapter in the book. They teach you who you should be and how you can reach places. In a way, students here are more uh, innovative and entrepreneurial in their approaches. And I think that's in part because we, you know, in this society, we've had to depend on ourselves for uh, so many things that are taken for granted. And it really was a lot of sort of various AB efforts that helped us get, you know, sort of street cred. Professors were surprisingly uh, lenient with our musical schedule, like we told them, you know, we, we have rehearsals, they're like, okay, fine, you can go rehearse today and tomorrow and next week. I always say without hesitation that it was the 10 most enriching years of my life. I think if I had to put it in concrete terms, it was being responsible for this uh, community, uh, which I, I really began to sense, you know, right from the time that lady with the gray hair said, don't make a mess of this. <laughs> It's too important.